Let me now change tack and talk about something completely different. Unlike what we've just seen previously, psychiatry is in a much more primitive state when it comes to trying to identify what is the actual pathology of the majority of psychotic disorders. What I want to present to you are, is, is really the thinking process that we've undertaken over the last few years to try and get to what might be the molecular pathology of schizophrenia and to show you some insights into where we think we might be able to develop something into the future. So I want to start with this slide because even though it may be familiar to many of you, I think it's worth reiterating for a couple of points. This is from the National, uh, or National Survey of High Impact Psychosis. So this is about schizophrenia predominantly, although it includes a bit of bipolar disorder and other disorders. This survey was done twice. It was done about 20 years ago and it's been repeated recently. And essentially, that outcome data that I can show you up there in, in the pie chart hasn't changed. In other words, despite the advent of a whole host of new Me Too drugs, there hasn't really been any significant improvement in outcome. And in particular, I want to make, a, make, a, make you aware or, or take your attention to the two grey uh, circles, which represent in the order of about 50% plus the green, 60% of people with schizophrenia have a poor outcome. And that's highlighted by the figures there, which show things such as 83% are single, 85% are on government benefits. None of this will be new to you. The point being that there is a whole plethora of untreated burden uh, related to schizophrenia and related psychoses. The reason for this is because of the heterogeneity of the symptoms that constitute the disorder. The, the yellow uh, rectangle up there, which says psychosis, talks about the majority of psychotic symptoms and the fact that they are the only current target for any treatment, any effective treatment that we have in schizophrenia. Antipsychotic drugs treat psychosis, they are indiscriminate, and they will treat any type of psychosis, but in schizophrenia, that's the only symptom domain that they treat. They also, psychosis also, is a major contributor to the unmet burden within schizophrenia. Many people have talked about the contribution of cognitive deficits and to the negative symptoms or the negative syndrome of schizophrenia. That's all well and good, but only when you've treated effectively the positive symptom domains of schizophrenia. The other group of symptoms, which are really thought in most senses to be comorbid with schizophrenia, but which I will argue during the rest of this talk to make potentially be a component of the disorder, are things such as suicidality and the neurological deficits. And in particular, I want to focus on suicidality. So, I want now to shift your attention to a drug called clozapine. And I introduced this drug, clozapine, because clozapine has two remarkable properties. The first remarkable property it has is that it is effective in treatment-resistant schizophrenia when no other drug is effective. It is in the order of about 30 to 50 percent of people who don't respond to standard antipsychotic drug treatments will respond to schizophrenia, uh, will, will respond to clozapine, and many clinicians would in fact believe that that's a much higher figure than that and that in the order of maybe 50 to 70 percent of people might respond when they don't respond to other antipsychotic drugs. The other peculiar property of schizophrenia is highlighted by the, by the FIN11 study which shows that people treated with clozapine have a reduced rate of suicidality and that this translates into a whole host of dimensions which have previously been thought to be uh, identifying suicidality as a comorbid feature of schizophrenia rather than an intrinsic feature of schizophrenia. Things such as this effect of clozapine is independent of depressive symptoms. It's apparent in first episode psychosis. It returns, suicidality returns back to normal when you stop clozapine. In other words, what it's arguing is that clozapine is appearing to have a direct effect on suicidality when it is a core component of schizophrenia. Uh, and the other feature of clozapine, as I mentioned before, is this capacity of clozapine to be able to treat treatment-resistant schizophrenia. So based on those premises, we decided to, and I'm sorry about the formatting on this, 
we decided to look at whether or not these four components uh, of treatment response, suicidality, clozapine response and functional impairment might share some fundamental common pathological characteristic and in fact whether or not this might be some mechanism through which clozapine was able to be effective. So our initial studies started off looking at the action of clozapine in primary cortical neurons from the frontal cortex in mice, so these are, these are our murine our primary cortical cultures, and what we found was that there was a effect which was common to all antipsychotic drugs, which was an initial inhibition of ERK phosphorylation. ERK phosphorylation was the uh, uh, by, um, marker in, in these assays. There was an initial inhibition, but that with the clinically uh, uh, with clinically effective antipsychotic drugs, which wasn't present with other non-effective drugs such as raclopride, which is the D2 receptor antagonist. However, clozapine was able to induce this delayed temporal activation, which can be seen here, and then it returned back to baseline. So this was interesting. We then replicated this in vivo, and I won't show you that data, but what we then did was to try and identify what this mechanism might be. And to cut a long story short, so this is a couple of years' worth of work summarised in a couple of slides, essentially all the canonical signalling pathways which have been implicated to explain clozapine's unusual action didn't explain this delayed phosphorylation of ERK. So this was intriguing for us because the serotonin 2A receptor, um, the standard GIGO pathways, the PKA pathways were not relevant to this delayed activation of ERK. And what we then did was to look at whether or not there might be some non-canonical signalling pathways involved. And what we identified, again to cut a long story short, was to show that this delayed activation of ERK by clozapine was entirely dependent, or significantly dependent, because it was blocked by the epidermal growth factor receptor inhibitor AG1478. Uh, what this was demonstrating for the very first time was that antipsychotic drug action, specifically clozapine, was having some biological effect in cortical neurons which was being mediated through the epidermal growth factor receptor. It wasn't mediated by other growth factor uh, receptors by the absence of the, uh, the effect of other inhibitors and we can see a dose response in that bottom panel. This was very intriguing for us because this, as I said, hadn't been shown before with any other antipsychotic drugs. And so we then looked to see whether or not there was a direct effect. And what I'm showing here, you here is that clozapine induced phosphorylation of EGFR. So this is uh, uh, immunofluorescent studies showing direct phosphorylation of EGFR, which was similar to the cognate ligand uh, for EGFR, which was EGF, and that the effects were relatively similar between the two uh, agents. This was very interesting for us because it raised for us the possibility that the epidermal growth factor receptor and the EGF system generally may potentially be involved in the pathology of schizophrenia and specifically the action of clozapine, and we were very interested because there had been a significant body of literature which had emerged identifying new regulant 1, which is one of the ligands here, as really the most robustly replicated sporadic genetic risk factor for schizophrenia, initially identified in an Icelandic cohort, but then replicated in numerous other uh, ethnic populations and has withstood a number of uh, meta-analyses. Now, the reason that this was interesting was because even though new regulin 1 is not a ligand for EGFR, but a ligand for ERP4, uh, as, as shown there, these receptors need to dimerize to, to signal and that there's been well documented evidence that both EGFR and ERP4 dimerize in cortical pyramidal neurons which are a potential site of action for uh, pathology in schizophrenia. So this was very exciting for us and what we went on to show was that in fact EGFR was co-localized both with cortical pyramidal neurons as well as with uh, GABA inter in GABA uh, GABAergic interneurons, which are the two potential sites of schizophrenia pathology, certainly in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. These are mouse studies, but we've shown this now in postmortem human brain. What this then prompted us to do was to see whether or not the EGF receptor might potentially be abnormal 
in postmortem human brain. This is the work of uh, one of our PhD students, Vali Swaminathan, who's writing up at the moment. What he was able to show initially using a cohort of tissue from New South Wales was that in fact there was an increase in the epidermal growth factor receptor in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex in people with schizophrenia uh, and schizoaffective disorder. But when you separated out those two groups, that it was really the group with schizophrenia who appeared to have this increase in EGFR. And that this was independent of the normal sort of confounding variables that are associated with postmortem human brain studies. He then went on to show that in contrast to this increase or uh, increased protein level, there was no change in expression. And this was interesting uh, because, I, I want you to bear that in mind for a moment, what we then did was we went back and were able to look, because of this, this thought that we had around the effect of clozapine and EGFR, we looked at whether or not there was an effect in suicide. And what we found was that there was an effect in suicide in that the increase in EGFR was present in those people who'd suicide, uh, who had not suicided or had no history of suicide attempts in contrast to those people who had suicided. So people who died of natural death had an increased level of EGFR, whereas those who did not didn't show any, a difference or an increase compared to uh, uh, healthy controls. However, when we looked at expression, we found the inverse pattern. We found that in fact there was increased expression of EGFR in those who died of suicide or had a history of suicide attempts, which was not found in those who did not. So what we're finding here are reciprocal changes in EGFR protein changes in contrast to expression level changes. And we haven't found the reason for this, we <coughs> postulate that there may well be uh, a whole set of post-translational factors which might be regulating these processes, but these at this point in time remain unexplored. However, what we then decided to do, given this set of findings, was to see whether or not we could find changes in the ligands for the EGFR. So what we then did was went to a completely different cohort of postmortem brain subjects. The first cohort I've just shown you data on are New South Wales. This is a Victorian postmortem brain collection, so a completely different cohort of subjects. And what we found for a number of very intriguing findings. The first and the most striking finding is that one of the ligands for the epidermal growth factor receptor, beta cellular, which is also a ligand for ERB4, was profoundly reduced in schizophrenia. And this is a very significant effect size in the order of about two that was present in schizophrenia but was not present in people with other psychiatric disorders. Now the important, uh, the, the important parameter around that is that these other patients were also treated with antipsychotic drugs. So we believe that this is unlikely to be due to an antipsychotic drug effect. We then looked at the other endogenous ligand for the EGFR, which is epidermal growth factor itself, and what we found was the reverse, that in fact EGF was increased in people with schizophrenia compared to healthy controls, uh, and that this effect seemed to correlate uh, with, uh, inversely correlate with each other, so that people who had low BTC, and they, they're the two graphs at the bottom there, People with low BTC had high EGF and people with high EGF had low BTC. What was important about that though was when we began to separate out the groups according to suicide and non-suicide, we found that the change in EGF only occurred in the group who did not suicide. So what we're beginning to develop here is a picture of low beta cellulin in people with schizophrenia However, people who didn't suicide appear to have high BTC, uh, sorry, high EGF and high EGFR. So we went on to look at the epidermal growth factor receptor level in this group, and that's exactly what we found. We found that they had an increased level of the epidermal growth factor receptor, and this began to make us wonder whether or not if low beta cellulin is a, is a trait effect of schizophrenia, whether or not a compensatory upregulation of both EGF and EGFR in response to low BTC might be some sort of compensatory mechanism which might ameliorate 
uh, suicidality or, or the pathology of suicide within schizophrenia. We then did a clinical study to see whether or not we could translate these findings into a biomarker. And this is the work of another PhD student who's also writing up, um, Sajeevan Sinathumbi. He conducted a prospective study looking at the effect of clozapine treatment in people with treatment resistant schizophrenia over a 26 week period. 26 weeks because if you haven't responded to clozapine by the end of 26 weeks, you're not going to respond pretty much. What we found was that first clozapine was able to differentiate a group of responders. That response group in this study was about 50%. The non-responders were about 50%. And you can see here that clozapine has quite a strong effect on positive symptoms and positive symptoms only, has no real effect on any of the other symptom domains uh, that are associated with schizophrenia. And that's an important point as I stated before. What we found was that when you measured this group, all the patients who had treatment resistant schizophrenia had very low levels of EGF, but that after 26 weeks of treatment they had an increase in EGF levels such that they were significantly higher than, those, uh, than they were at baseline. However, all groups were still significantly lower than healthy controls, as you can see there. The other important point was that the effect, the increase was significant at about six weeks. When we divided it up into responders and non-responders, we found a small effect. I don't want to make too much of a point about this. However, what we found was that the responders increased a bit. Non-responders uh, seemed to also show a, a trend in that direction, but it wasn't significant. What was much more compelling for us was the difference in beta cellulin. So this is really the first study looking at beta cellulin in schizophrenia, peripheral beta cellulin over a, in a prospective study. A number of key points. Firstly, at baseline, people with schizophrenia had profoundly lower levels of beta cellulin compared to healthy controls. Uh, and there, what, that decrease persisted over time, but wasn't significant at 26 weeks. However, what we found was that this really dichotomized into responders and non-responders. And what we found was that the non-responders weren't significantly different to baseline and that they didn't really show a response after 26 weeks, whereas the responders to clozapine were significantly lower and they maintained a very low level throughout the course of, uh, uh, throughout the course of treatment. What we can see here is the, is the differences. So this is clustered according to responders and non-responders, and you can see that there's a very big difference just in absolute levels between responders and non-responders uh, at 26 weeks in beta cellulin levels. And this is the correlation with symptoms. Now, the most important and interesting correlation with symptoms is actually this graph, this set of, this set of graphs, which essentially show that the baseline level of beta cellulin correlates with the response to symptoms at 26 weeks. So that essentially uh, by plotting out or, or by measuring plasma beta cellulin at baseline, you should be able to get a reasonable estimate of what that person's likelihood to respond to clozapine is, which suggests that potentially uh, peripheral beta cellulin may be able to serve as a biomarker for clozapine response in schizophrenia. This is obviously early data, small study, um, and needs to be replicated, which we're hoping to do, uh, but it was certainly indicative of, of a, a possible trend in that direction. We've gone on now to look at whether or not there might potentially be genotypic markers which can add to the model of prediction. And I'm just showing you some very early data. There's much more extensive data that we're working on at the moment, which seems to suggest that there are a number of SNPs which seem to be in LD which associate with uh, response or non-response. And this is in a much larger data set. This is, in fact, with the Australian Schizophrenia Research Bank, which has about 650 cases and 650 controls. So. To conclude, I think it is possible, uh, and, and I know this, this has been a holy grail in psychiatric research, but I think it is possible to get some biomarker prediction in schizophrenia. But to do so, they really must 
stop focusing on heterogeneous symptom clusters such as schizophrenia and rather focus on what might be specific clinical features of the disorder which potentially then become much more tractable uh, to biological investigation. I've listed the four that I think are potentially worthwhile from a clinical perspective and which we believe that at least we've got some traction on. We believe because we've investigated the mechanism of action of clozapine and that clozapine invokes EGFR signalling, um, which implicates EGF system in changes in these outcomes, we believe that maybe the EGF system uh, changes which occur in the CNS in schizophrenia and associate with suicidality may be, in fact, tractable targets for the development of, of uh, plausible biomarkers and that peripheral EGF ligand levels which are modulated by clozapine treatment and appear to be associated with symptom change and predict response. And uh, we're certainly at this point in time seeing whether or not we can replicate and validate those initial studies. So with that, I'll stop there, um, thank the people who've done the work, which of course were all from my old um, site, and hopefully we'll be able to, to transfer all of that across to, to Monash uh, in the coming months. Thank you.